The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 54071808501, AFSL 228986, and Mason Stevens Limited, ABN 91141447207, AFSL 351578, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. The opinions expressed within this podcast are solely the individuals and do not reflect the opinions and beliefs of Mason Stevens, Morningstar or Ensemble. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, VFS Group Investment Manager, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things at the right weight for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up over the Ensemble platform. All the information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. This series is brought to you by Mason Stevens, a specialist wealth platform provider that focuses on managed account solutions. Recognized by investment trends in 2023 as the most improved platform and by advisor ratings in 2022 for best advisor support, Mason Stevens offers outsourced CIO services that complement their platform and managed account solutions. Established in 2010, Mason Stevens is led by some of Australia's most experienced finance and investment professionals. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director, Barclay Pierce Capital's Asset Management Division. I'm going to get that right one day and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and client asset class selection. We are trying to find the things that are not only appropriate but are also the things that actually work and maybe try and find the right time to be the right weight for the right clients, that wholesome, beautiful trilogy if you can find it. Or So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform and obviously all information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Also, get more questions into into the platform. I will continue to ask them as best that I can. So with no further ado, they say, don't trust a skinny chef. I love that expression. They also (laughs) say, don't trust a stockbroker without a bit of grey around the sides. Uh, Why? Because... Well, the chef one is easy, um, but uh, when it comes to the stockbroker, you need to see, you need a broker, you need an advisor, usually that you need one who has seen one or two market cycles uh, that does make them a better a better advisor in my view. Um, that's, uh, that's one way of putting it, apparently. I've made, made sure I wrote apparently here in my little script. As a young broker, I was always amazed at the old guys and girls' ability to remain calm in a panic and know when the tide was turning on a big move and react appropriately and calmly in the client's best interests. It's a skill I've always tried to find, and once I do find it, I always try and improve it. So how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? I love that expression too. In terms of economic cycles, and what do you do when? How much do you put and where do you put it? Therein lies the question. I could not ask for two better names to help us crawl through the pipes of this question. It is, uh, I'm joined by freshly appointed head of asset allocation, David Macri of Mason Stevens. David was previously the CIO of Australian Ethical for 14 years and comes with a strong record. A little bit of grey around the size as well. It's just enough. A lot of grey. Uh, David, how are you now? Good. Thanks, James. Uh, also joining us from Morningstar is the incredible Jodie Fitzgerald, head of Insto Investment Management. Uh, Jodie, how are you now? Yeah, good. Thank you. Well, uh, David, everyone gets the same mood setting question since you are a, a, a new guest here on the show. Um, it's not as blunt as it, as it may sound, but it's imperative for the Mason Stevens thing because not like the other fund managers that we may have on the show. So really quickly, what do you do? How do you make money? Thanks, James. Um, so I'm head of asset allocation. So I guess Mason Stevens is a little bit different, like you mentioned, product 
a platform provider, uh, much like NetWealth and Hub24, but what differentiates us from them is that we also offer investment expertise. And so my remit is doing the asset allocation um, for our clients and for the managed portfolios that we managed, that we manage internally, and that we offer to, to boutique advisors. Excellent. Good, good overview. And so, okay, so you've come into that. You're, you're fresh in the job, which is good. Um, finding your feet still, or is it, uh, is it all pretty much sort of set and forget and getting it and getting it done there? Uh, well, yeah, definitely hit the, hit the floor running. Um, yeah. there's a lot to do and really interesting time to, to begin as an asset allocation guy. So, yeah, it could um, be. Yeah, lots of uncertainty and lots of, lots of things to consider. Well, do you want to get right into that now while we're here and, and Jody, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to you in just a second. Sure. But, um, Let's just talk about the market cycles. If we want to go local, or would you like to start in the US? Um, uh, it's it's a global mandate that you've got, I believe, or is it a yes? Yeah. So, where would you like to start with well, regards to what part of the cycle that we're in around, or generally speaking, the economy that you see it right now? You said there's lots of uncertainty. Yes. Five weeks ago, I think that a, a war started. I might have been yeah. closer than that. It's a great time to sort of get set. Get set. What are you seeing? Well, you you have to look at the US, right? The US is a, a, a big driver of what's happening around the world. Um, and we're, what we are seeing, a lot of uncertainty around where inflation and interest rates are going to end up. Um, inflation in the G7 economies rose from an average of 0.8% in 2020 to a peak of 7.8% in mid-22. So inflation has dropped back since then. A lot of that's been in response to easing in supply disruptions and tighter monetary policy. Um, It's also likely to fall even further over the coming year. Mm -hmm. Um, But interestingly, what that leads to is short-term interest rates, and they're at the highest level in more than 20 years in nominal terms. So, you know, it's something that a lot of young investors haven't seen before. Yeah. And especially the the rapid rise in those rates. Well, here I'll throw it out then. Are we higher for longer or is it uh, sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy that, that the, the peak in interest rates is sort of what actually then makes them go down? That's a good one. Um, <laughs> You've got to do, you do it with your hands when you're doing it as well. Okay. Yeah, because uh, the most important thing is actually interest rate expectations. Mm. Okay, so And when you have a look at the volatility that we've experienced in the market – this year, but in particular over the last few months, um, it has been around changing expectations and nothing more. Um, so with regards to whether or not, if you, if you go back to the beginning of uh, this year, so the beginning of 2023, um, people will effectively of the belief that the significant rise in interest rates to combat inflation would lead to a recession um, and that that was going to be a good thing because it means interest rates would come back down. So mm. markets rallied. And it's only over the last sort of few weeks or months that the market has sort of come to grips with the fact that actually the economy hasn't slowed as expected. Mm. A recession hasn't appeared as expected. And therefore, it's highly feasible that interest rates will remain higher for longer. And the reason why that is impactful is because people are trying to determine what is the discount rate they should be using to value all assets off. <laughs> so their expectation of interest rates is the thing that is really driving market volatility at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And okay, so that's that's generally speaking the US, um, probably here as well. Everywhere. Yeah, here. Everywhere. Here, here, here. Well, the reason why the US is important because the, you know, I often say to people that most important number as an investor for you to actually have your mind around is the US 10 year mm-hmm. bond yield. And the reason for that is that's the global risk free rate of which all asset prices price. So what happens to that is extremely important. Um, and it will impact the pricing of assets here in the Australian market and so forth as yep. well. Yeah, anyone who uh, is new to that, absolutely make sure that it comes up on your screen and then you at least know, generally speaking, where it moves mm. up and down. Absolutely. Um, you're not necessarily obliged to know the exact number every day. Although you did ask me as soon as I walked in. Do you got to know? <laughs> <laughs> You've got to know. I don't have to oh, yeah, know. Yeah, fair point, fair point. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. Okay, so, so now we're just going to get into one of the advisor questions here. Um, we, we, we've, we've spoken about the U.S., uh, okay, David, how are key asset classes positioned? A nice and easy sort of one to get straight off it. Pick the key asset class that you would uh, that you would choose to start with and tell us how they're positioned at what part of the cycle. And then we'll start to draw out how maybe clients should be positioned or how advisors should be structuring portfolios to take advantage of maybe what's ahead. Okay. Thanks, There's a lot there. Go. Yep. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's start with equities, the biggest yep. asset class. Um, the most volatile, the most risky in terms of traditional asset classes. 
uh, as Jody mentioned, the reference rate is the 10 year bond yield, um, whether it's US or Australian. You know, you, you're, you're basically pricing your asset relative to the risk free rate. And that's, me, that's important because why would you put money in an asset that is more risky and giving you not not enough return for that extra risk. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're looking at that, you know, cash and fixed income is now offering mid-single digit returns. So the hurdle for equities is higher. Uh, when we're looking at valuations, you look at uh, one of the things you look at is the equity risk premium. And that's how much risk is, is being priced in. Um, and that at the moment is below the long-term average by around one standard deviation, both, okay. both for the US and for Australia. Um, so that's looking expensive on that measure. Now, when expectations of the bond yield moves, so does you know the, the expected valuations of, of these assets. Um, you know, you're looking at PEs. A lot of people look at price to earnings ratios of the market, uh, and, and if you look at that measure in Australia, it's looking to be around around about the long term median, long term average. Um, but there are other measures to look at. So if you're thinking of you know what it is relative to Real yields, and if you, you know, Australia's got a large resources segment to the market, so excluding the resources, um, you, you're looking at it, it is high relative to that as well. So looking expensive. Um, now, if there is a recession and a lot of people are pricing in or expecting a recession next year, um, but the severity of that, you know, is, uh, is highly uh, unclear. Um, what that does to earnings is important. Mm -hmm. So there's two sides to the valuation argument. There's, yes, there's a valuation, and then there's what happens to earnings. So you know the FY24 EPS growth expectations for the Australian market has fallen to negative five percent, and that's according to Macquarie, um, and that's driven by the banks. The banks are also a big segment for the Australian market, and resources down at minus eighteen percent. So just just run me by that. So the expectation earnings expectation for our resources sector is down. 18% from the current levels or from where it was before? Well, EPS growth. Okay, EPS growth yeah, is actually year on year. I got you. Okay. Yeah. 18%. Yeah. So year on year. It's a highly cyclical yeah. sector, um, you know, driven by commodity market, commodity prices, and uh, that's being driven about what the expectations of the global economy are. Especially right? for China. And yeah, China's a big part of it. So, where is, so, the, and this is sort of something that I wanted to talk about a little bit as well. Yeah. Well, we've got, Lots of different cycles sort of going on at the same time. Take, mm. for example, the difference between Japan, the US, mm. and China um, going on to now. It's how do you reconcile that as an as an allocator? How do you reconcile those different things with regards to portfolio management? Yeah. Who wants it? I'll start. Yes. I'll have a go. <laughs> um, and I think what's really interesting, and, and before we go with the how you reconcile it, it's important to sort of reflect on where we've been as well. So for a very long time, for the best part of a decade, the macro and fiscal environment in the vast majority of regions was the same. So we all had perpetually falling interest rates down to sort of a zero or near zero interest rate policy, low inflation, growth, etc. So regional divergences um, weren't quite weren't very large at all. Stepping into this part of the cycle, we have some very different macro. Uh, scenarios playing out, whether it be in the US or Europe, or Australia, Japan, China, as you mentioned. And as a result, we are probably going to see for the first time in a very long time, divergent interest rate policy. Oh, okay. Right. And divergent interest rate policy will then for have impact on asset flows and capital and where it will actually go. So for example, if... Um, so the obviously we've recently had uh, another interest rate increase here in the Australian market, um, but the rhetoric is that it looks like you know they'll be data led, etc., and they're starting to soften their language with regards to how many more interest rate increases may be required. Mm -hmm. And while the US is also softening their language, the reality is the US is in a very different position from a macro perspective. Their unemployment rate is still quite low. Their consumer is actually still extremely robust. Um, wage growth is certainly coming off, but the reality is the economy is pretty strong over there. So it's really difficult to see in what universe the Fed could start to cut rates unless something's gone horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. If you then have other regions starting to cut because they are going into a slower period from an economic perspective, you start to get divergence in interest rates. And that will lead to different payoffs 
for different regions and that will impact asset prices from, you know, b- mainly because of the flows. So the weight of money that will then move into the US chasing higher levels of yield, uh, it'll have an impact then on, on FX positioning, etc. So I think what's really important for investors um, is that for a very long time, over the last sort of decade or so, your asset allocation decisions were really refined to the big asset classes. Do I go overweight international equities, overweight Aussie equities, et cetera? It's actually going to become a lot more bespoke, Ooh, I think, okay. going forward in the sense that you actually will need to have a view on what regions you want to be overweight or underweight yep. and even down to the sector or industry level. Predominantly because of the phase of the cycle that we're stepping into where we have uh, debt is going to start to be a problem for, for some businesses that are going to need to refinance at higher levels. Yes. So you're going to start to see a lot of divergence in the performance at a regional level, at a sector level, and that is where asset allocation will really add value in this next phase of the market cycle. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the, the zombie thing is one that, that a lot of people, zombie companies being, you know, your 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 interest that you have to repay is physically higher than the amount of money that you make, putting it very simply. I know that someone will correct me for that somewhere. But the um, the zombie thing is going to be a thing um, and a lot of people have warned about that for a long time. With regards to sector-specific and region-specific, I've, I've been talking for ages that emerging markets has been treated as one big box for too long. It has, absolutely. And it should be split. I'm an emerging markets sort of guy. Yep. It should be split into numerous sort of things. Hmm. Take India out and put it separately, if, if you ask me, but that's it's a whole different situation. Okay, so we've done equities. David, back to you. Bonds, or what's next on your list? I mean, we have touched on bonds about where they're going to go. You could pretty much just follow the flow of money. I mean, at the end of October, the bond inflows, institutional inflows into the bond market in the US were huge. You could see what was going to come next. Yeah. Um, in yeah. that one. But anyway, so I'll let you talk. Really interesting because the volatility in the yields are just – is, is really high, the, and that's just driven by the uncertainty of where rates and inflation are going is going to go. So, um, and it changes, you know, almost on a daily basis by the, what the expectations of the Fed rates are and how that flows through to the to the whole yield curve. And um, you know, we we had not long ago an inverted yield curve, and that's been you know that gap's been narrowing a little bit, but still somewhat inverted. And that's uh, normally a sign of a pending recession. You know. What the lag is, it's you know usually around eight to ten months. So um, again, if recession is coming, then you know yields will fall. Maybe you know if, if you see a, a, a US ten year yield at with a five percent handle, then you know maybe that's a good time to go in and get exposure to some duration. I agree. Mm. I agree. I think it just depends on what you're doing in the other parts of your portfolio. Uh-huh. So you can actually have a look at an asset class as a um, an alpha opportunity. So can I add value from it? Will I make money from it? or actually as a risk mitigator. So it, I think the allocation that you have really also depends on the, the, the broader allocations. So the reality is, and the reason why you're seeing a lot of flows starting to go into fixed income is that for a very long time with yields at near zero, duration was super expensive. Like there was a bubble in duration and mm. it just you were not being paid to hold it at all. Yeah. You can now actually get a decent running yield um, and the roll down that you get from that running yield as well should compensate you for any further interest rate increases from here. Did you we would have to, to see. Go on, go on. So effectively, when you um, you actually um, look at a bond and we're pricing a bond, effectively what you're looking at is the cash flows that that bond over time and then sort of, you know, you're discounting the back and what should you pay for it today. So duration is something that you will hear about a lot, which is effectively the sensitivity of the bond market to interest rate changes. Now, the higher the duration, the more sensitive. So if you've got a duration, and this is very simple, back of the envelope mass. And yeah, it's not, don't send letters. It's not exactly yeah, how it works, yeah. but to give you a conceptual idea, right, is that if the duration's five and interest rates increase by one, so 1%. then you should expect about a 5% capital loss. However, I like I like when I get it right, and it means yeah, I've, I've, yeah. I've listened so, correctly. <laughs> so when interest rates were increasing, <laughs> when interest rates were increasing, and your the yield that you were getting from that bond was nothing, you were just having full capital loss, and nothing was being offset by income flowing out of the coupon payments from the bond. Mm-hmm. Now that you're actually getting coupon payments or, you know, payments coming through from the bond, it compensates you. So we can't pick where the interest rate cycle will end. I'd love to say I can, but I'm not that smart. And I don't think anybody is quite fair, uh, mm. to, to be fair. 
But what you do know is that we, as investors, we always think in terms of probability. So on the basis of probability, are we likely to see another 13 interest rate increases from here? Probably not. Probably not, right? So you would need to see some rather significant interest rate increases to completely wipe out the yield that you're clipping on that fixed income investment. So 2022 is unlikely to repeat this year, you know, over the coming sort of, you know, year or two. So the fear of that, I think people can put out of the back of their mind, but that's not to say you won't see capital losses in bonds. The reason why you'll want bonds though is that the market is concerned about a recession. If you get a recession, bonds do well in that environment. Mm-hmm. So it comes down to are you holding bonds because you think it will generate a high return or are you holding it because it's actually going to be the thing that will buoy your portfolio in an economic downturn? So, so from our perspective, we've been adding bonds and adding duration to the portfolio. We've been careful about where and how we add credit because credit spreads haven't really been priced appropriately for the risk of a recession. I've, I've heard that as well. Yeah. David, are you overweight bonds locally or internationally? Uh, we are neutral okay. duration. Yep. Um, and we are looking at you know how we can position the portfolios a little bit more defensive. Um, as Jody mentioned, what we're looking at, you, how you – you consider that is probabilities. And so what we think about is the probabilities of different market regimes driven by inflation and growth. And mm. so if if you think that um, we're moving into a period of um, lower growth and, and you know higher inflation remaining, then you do want to try and think about how you position yourself defensively um, and start incrementally kind of adjusting the portfolios. So... Uh, just to guard it a little bit against that 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 risk. Yep. Well, let, let's just talk now locally, talking about the inflationary outlook, and this is another one of these questions that we had here. Um, over the last few weeks, I have noticed, and in fact, over the last year, we had a an old the old Reserve Bank governor who I used to joke would stand in a crowded restaurant and try and stop people from eating and spending money. How many more rate rate hikes can I give you people before you all leave the restaurant? Everyone, you ask people what their sentiment was and the outlook for the economy was, and everyone says it's awful. And yet restaurants are full, planes mm. are full, everything, everyone is still spending, everyone is out. Restaurants full of people complaining about the economy is the <laughs> was the term that I made it. And it's is it am I wrong? I'm not. No. They are. And we've seen lots of crowds out there. How long does the inflation situation in Australia maintain? What happens next? How does it link back to, to, to portfolios, specifically just talking about the Australian side? Who wants it? David? Yeah. <laughs> you took a break. It's yours. Such a <laughs> fundamental and key question uh, to the outlook. So yeah, I think the RBA yesterday came out and obviously raised rates by 25 basis points. Um, the market took that positively because the, you know, the dovish tone that they took in delivering that raise and it sounded like it could be the last one, right? And there's, there's a there's a touching wood. There it is. Yep. Market yep. pricing kind of increased. You've just guaranteed another I one. Can't you know, afford, no, don't I can't you? afford another fifty basis points over there. Yeah, market. market yeah, well, market. yeah. It's impacting lots of people, right? Yep. And and um, it should flow through to lower consumer spending. Now the consumer has held up um, pretty, you know, pretty resiliently both here and in the US, but. Um, and, and that's, I guess, being driven by unemployment. The employment market's still strong. There's still low unemployment. But there are some signs that leading indicators are starting to, to roll over. Mm. So if if the employment market does start to turn, it will undoubtedly impact growth. So let, Okay, so let's now join this in with the actual portfolio management side of things. So at what stage do you see the term, what, what what triggers should you be looking for? Because this is all about the cycle, right? So at what time do you see that cycle turning over and how do you then make switches specifically or well, not too specifically, but within your portfolio that you should just be looking out for? As in, when I when I opened the podcast, I was talking about the the big tide turning and the old head score is sort of know when, when it's switching and not reacting at shadows. Where's where, where does the ship start to turn in the harbour? So how many metaphors can I jam in? <laughs> yeah. yeah. well, that was it's good effort there. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I think it's kind of fraught to wait up until a certain very high likelihood of an event. So there's lots of indicators you can look at. There's the labour market. There's inflation itself, obviously, and the leading indicators there. Um, but if you if you wait for a certain event to then act on that to change your portfolio, you're pretty much guaranteed to be too late and get it wrong. And that's why a, a lot of fund managers. Um, would rather leave some money on the table and be late, uh, or move early, sorry, um, 
then because it's the worst thing you can do is actually be right but then too slow to to react yeah right? yeah um so and and that's why how i described it before is it, you can start moving incrementally so as the chances increase of a certain event you know be it a negative economic or a positive economic development you start kind of moving then try to make trying to make the portfolios more resilient to different types of regimes yeah australia think, inflation portfolio movement yeah i think uh i think the inflation outlook is still a bit tricky um so even though headline um inflation has been moderating the reality is the trim, which is the number they look at, mm-hmm. is still pretty high. It's still at 5.2, right? That is still well and truly above the 2 to 3% band that, that is actually targeted. There are lags, though, obviously, in the way monetary policy works, and they may have done enough and can pause. The problem is, though, if they haven't and they need to go again, the issue with this sporadic neutral, dovish, neutral, dovish um, could actually lengthen this cycle mm. in terms of how long it takes to get inflation down to the level they truly want it and therefore, you know, impact what happens from a growth perspective. From an overall portfolio perspective, though, you know, the reality is we, we don't ever shift a portfolio based on our belief of where the economy will, gonna, will go because I guarantee you all get it wrong. Yep. We'll all get it wrong. Yeah, we'll see. So what we focus on is what's priced in. So what is a fair value of an asset and then how is that asset currently being priced? So that's how you th- that's how the macro gets incorporated into your portfolio because we talked earlier about interest rate expectations. So changes in oh, the market volatility that we're experiencing at the moment is predominantly because of people's view of interest rate expectations, mm-hmm. which is based on their view of the economy. economy. Yep. All right. So as they you know, throw everything out of the, you know, window and say, oh, interest rates are going to be higher for longer and the market sells off, for us, assuming that it's actually a reasonable price, that becomes an opportunity to start to push into an asset segment. What you want is um, to understand the temperature of the room that you're standing in, Ooh, effectively. Another metaphor. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the most important element is that understanding what is an asset worth, what should you pay for it, but then what environment am I operating within? What's the temperature of the room? And that helps you understand how you should calibrate or size that position. So for us, it's about having, uh, as David mentioned, robustness in your portfolio because we don't know the path from here. There are certainly inflation risks on the upside. They could you know, it could go down. Who knows, right? What you want to do is ensure that your portfolio can actually perform in different market environments and then lean it towards the environment that you think on the basis of probability has the higher chance of actually playing out. Okay. Um, and as David said, like in going back to the whole, if you wait until the moment, it's the market's already priced it in. So hence that point of what's priced in. Yep. Yep. That is, uh, that is very well said. Okay. On that note, we're going to switch over to a bit of fun stuff. Here now, here's I'll give you the the layout of this. It's, and I heard someone speak, and they're from a different company, so I won't mention who it was. But very smart guy, head of thematic thematic investments at an ETF provider, very exciting person. And he was he gave the best descriptor of why the magnificent seven tech stocks in the states had been rallying as strongly as they had when nobody thought that they were going to in the face of this recession that we saw. The discounted cash flow, he said, throw that out the window. It doesn't apply to them. Revolutionary stuff, I know. Mm. Um, it doesn't matter. They are they, they they don't care about the cash situation. They are cashed up bogans, and if they need to and if they need to borrow, they've just got the stock. It, it doesn't apply to them. They don't need to borrow off uh, the usual way that people do. An amazing dis- descriptor. It was probably a bit more specific than I was, and a, and, and a bit more um, relevant too. And then he said, and the next thing, so people now talk about, okay, well, what happens if there's a recession and you've got the seven stocks that go into it? And he said the productivity in improvements that those big companies are making means that any recessionary impact is actually going to be negated as well. Again, revolutionary, but hey, he was talking his own book and he was a thematic, you know, thematic ETF <laughs> researcher. Yeah, yeah. That's what he was. But it, it was innovative stuff for me. How is productivity weighing in to, and especially with AI? I mean, you have, yeah. you can't have a podcast without saying AI now. <laughs> so a couple of women have to get that far without me saying. It. How is how is productivity from AI now sort of being factored into the, to, to your thinking or at least the way that you're shaping it? Or even how is AI assisting you doing what you're doing? Who wants it first? David, you haven't spoken for a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, we think the impact of generative AI uh, on productivity is huge. Mm. And it's, the potential is very large, but it's highly uncertain. So, And that's when things get difficult to price in. 
So, you know, it, it has driven a lot of, you know, a lot of share prices higher, but I would say that it's not fully priced in. Um, and as things become more certain, then they, they incrementally get priced in further. But I guess what we do know is that Moore's law is real. Uh, we're wired to think linearly, not exponentially, which is why we so often underestimate the power of new technologies. Look, there's been lots of reports published. McKinsey did a, did a massive one, and they found that 50% automation expectations was brought forward a decade, and that generative AI would add between 6 and $8 trillion US dollars to global GDP. Mm-hmm. Goldman Sachs estimates that it could increase global GDP by 7%, or circa seven trillion dollars to GDP, so these are big, big numbers. Yeah, those aren't muck around numbers. Yeah, but, um, but is that inflationary? Well, increased or productivity. Increased productivity. I would argue is technology. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I think it's. But I think that's the question as portfolio managers that is important. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I think it is deflationary. So when businesses become more efficient mm. and it can produce more, you know, goods and services with fewer resources. This can lead to a decrease in prices, right? They get bigger economies of scale. How it impacts wages and employment dynamics is also important because if automation displaces workers and leads to significant unemployment or wage stagnation for certain segments of the workforce, it can put downward pressure on consumer spending, which is, again, deflationary. Yeah, it's a really um, uh, uh, it's, look. It's one of those things. A, it's not new, right? Firstly, it's been around for ages. It's just sort of you know noticeable now, more than anything. But productivity is important, and the productivity gate. I, I guess with the productivity and how it would then flow through to thinking about it as a as an investor is, you know, does it improve the unit cost of you know the the, the cost that are uh, of, of the a, widget of, a, of the widget? Yeah. yeah, and does that come down? And then, therefore, they can sell it for less, et cetera. You're, you are, however, with displaced labor, likely to then get a further disparity of income inequality, which then causes other issues, which then leads to other policies needing to be put in place, et cetera. Yep. But I also think, though, that you know a lot of people sort of talk about the productivity gains and how that's going to be deflationary and how great that is, et cetera. But we kind of forget about what the, the snippet that we've seen in the market over the last couple of years has been that there was a thought that the baby boomers retiring would be deflationary and it looks like it's actually not, it's inflationary yeah. because you've had a significant drop in the participation rate. So COVID, particularly when you look at the US, COVID did something quite profound and it's unclear at the moment if it is structural in nature or not in the sense that the labour force participation rate still has not recovered back to pre-COVID levels. And okay. what appears to have occurred is that a lot of people who were getting closer to retirement just went, well, I'm, you know, I'm out. Checking out. All right. Yeah. Done. Yeah. So. I wanted to be one of them. And part of the reason why we've had an inflation <laughs> issue is that. Yeah, <laughs> part of the issue that we've had inflation is that, yes, there's been supply constraints and, and so forth, but you've actually just had a good old fashioned overheating economy where yeah. you had wage price inflation, which was huge. So the question then becomes, does AI just allow enough productivity gains to compensate for ageing population? And in which case, you know, the degree to which it is actually impactful. From so it's an negating, economic, negating the it, dropping pro- yeah. participation. So does it negate it or does it sort of go beyond negating it, I think is sort of an, a question that's that's worthwhile ad- addressing. I, I get concerned about people just wanting to buy tech stocks because it's AI and it's growth and so forth. And we've actually started having this conversation internally about it, it's hard to price something that you don't know, that's blue sky, right? You don't know where it's going to go. You don't know what the technology is going to be and therefore what it should be worth. Yeah. But then there's another sort of element of to what degree are these businesses actually, are we thinking about them wrong? And they're not growth companies, but they're utilities because we use – what they produce daily in the same way that if I can't work without the software and all of the bits and pieces that get supplied to me by these tech companies mm. in the same way, I need the utility to turn the lights on, etc. That's true. So there's, I think there's an interesting shift in the way that we need to, and the, going back to your earlier point about throw the DCF out the window, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily throw it out the window. I think that's quite dramatic. But <laughs> I think understanding that there is a utility element to these businesses that we probably haven't thought through properly. Good point. Um, that then impacts what it's truly worth. 
Sorry, that just felt like a rant. That's all right. No, there was, I, was, I was just going to let you go. D- David, if you want to come <laughs> well, in and talk about yeah, this. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting point because if you consider them utilities, but they're still high-growing utilities. Yeah. So it's a massive premium that you need to apply to these 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 stocks. Mm. But I, I agree. Look, everything has a price and yep. uh, things very often get ahead of get ahead of themselves um, and often get oversold. So, uh, But they do kind of seem to surprise on the upside more often mm. than not. Yeah. Oh, well, and that's both fantastic answers and an amazing discussion. Uh, last question and then I think I'm going to have to close it off. We're running out of tape. Um, the discussing and, and this is a good one actually we've answered most of the questions that are on here um, there's a few double ups so it's quite good the last one that I've got here discussing portfolios within the inflationary environment with mm. clients and I think that I think that when we were sort of prepping for this podcast because we do prep for this podcast although it sounds differently I think that we had different we had a different interpretation Speak for yourself <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, it's 4.75% I think um, the, the, um, uh, what well, I think we had different interpretations on how this question, um, this mm. sentence um, actually came out. Discussing discussing portfolios within the inflationary environment with clients. Mm. I'm going to let you have your own interpretation of it and bounce between both of you. David. Okay. Uh, so my interpretation was an advisor sitting with a client, how do you discuss this? Um, you know, it's look fundamental to forecasts and risk return assumptions, essentially. Uh, inflation expectations is the main driver of interest rates and bond yields, which, like as Jody mentioned, is the reference rate for more risky assets. Um, however, inflation itself is not necessarily all that bad for equities, I would say. It's more about the impact on growth. Uh, so you can have different outcomes from that. Um, if we have high inflation but with high economic growth, which flows through to corporate earnings and low unemployment, etc., it's still generally favorable for equities. Um, the ideal scenario, which is, you know, in hindsight, what we've been in for a, a long time before COVID, or pre-GFC even, which is often referred to as a Goldilocks environment, and that's the low inflation, high growth scenario. Um, the opposite is the inflationary scenario, which is generally bad for equities, but not so bad for bonds, which is also the case for diversification in your portfolio. Yeah. Yep. I just think it's important to put yourself in the client's shoes, right? Yeah. So why do they care? Well, they care because their wealth is being degraded, right? So particularly if you are a retiree, and this is where the conversation is probably more likely to occur than someone who's in their 20s or 30s, right, is that, well, my expenses are going up because of inflation and I've still just got this pot of money. So it's about how do I make sure that my – assets are maintaining pace with inflation. So a lot of super funds and you know and, and investment portfolios will have a inflation target, so CPI plus three, four, five, depending on what risk profile you want, et cetera. Mm-hmm. The reality is that when inflation is high, that hurdle is harder to hit. So you need to generate just CPI as your starting point to not go backwards. Tell me about it. All right. And then if you want to grow your wealth because most people are underfunded or you're in the wealth generation um, uh, generating uh, years of your life, you then need to add over and above that. So what you're looking at is fairly significant returns. The reality is the outlook for capital markets in general is not that flash. And that's because most markets, even though we've had a lot of volatility and it feels like we've had big sell-offs, the vast majority of markets are still overvalued. Um, there's, you know, emerging markets where we're seeing most valuation starting to creep through. So there's about 45% of emerging markets are currently trading below their, uh, what we see as their fundamental fair value, but it's only about 30% of developed markets. So if markets are still not cheap and there is a high degree of economic uncertainty, it means that the capital outlook for those markets could be quite challenged. Mm-hmm. Delivering a high return in that environment is hard. And I think you just kind of need to step your clients through that and understand one of the things that, you know, it might be necessary, particularly if you know that having a portfolio, it comes down to a portfolio construction question. How do you ensure the robustness of the portfolio? How do you make sure that you've got things in there that can just nicely achieve that CPI return effectively? So investing in parts of the market or equities that uh, will do well irrespective of if you go into a recession or not or if there's inflation or not because they can pass on that inflationary cost. Yep. Um, do you need a higher exposure to growth assets? Because if the return hurdle is higher because inflation's high and the capital market outlook is not flash, 
you know, you might need to actually start thinking about, do I need to take a little bit more risk, but risk in a, in a sensible way yeah. to generate return profile that I actually need. Very good. And I actually think the other element to sort of remind people of is that with the rising interest rates, it's actually opened up investment opportunities in yielding assets like bonds and so forth that we've not seen in a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, I, I have to say that, and I, I did mention this a few years ago, it was, no, it's the end of, it was the end of 2021, and we were talking about the potential for int- uh, interest rate rises. Mm. And I'd, I'd, I'd said something colossally like uh, out of this world. I said 4 or 5% isn't out, in, outside of the horizon. The pile on that came from, especially from the Twitter crowd, Oh yeah, it was incredible for this uh, for this sort of thing. Oh, you know, James, you know, the the buildings will burn over and mm-hmm. people will be dying in the streets if it gets to that sort of level and the whole thing. And I said, uh, I'll tell you what. Apart from all of that stuff, I'm looking forward to actually being able to allocate mm. to the bond market and having and and so that I don't have to go so far to the risk uh, up the risk curve yeah. to be able to achieve performance. Is it easier, David? Oh, th- there's the last question. Well, this is, this is, this is this all finished. It's it? definitely more appealing now, yeah. right? So, you know, we touched on it before, but it was it wasn't very <laughs> it wasn't a very interesting investment proposition mm. to go into that area. But now, you know, and everyone's searching and searching for yield in whatever assets they could get. But now you are finding yield in lower risk type assets, yeah. which absolutely makes it interesting. Yep. Um, private credit is 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 growing. It's booming around the world. Uh, and that's an interesting space, right? Like you, you, you're getting access to good, good corporates that uh, is offering high yield. You know. Now, J- Jody, did you did say that you're hesitant with credit because of the spreads? Yeah. Were- so it just depends on where you're playing in the part, credit part of the market, right? Again, what's priced in, okay. um, and have the spreads widened enough to account for you know, potentially economic hard times for some of these businesses, particularly the higher yielding. Uh, sorry, not higher yielding. The um. Uh, lower grade debt where they're going to have to refinance at much higher rates as, as their debt rolls over. Yeah. And David, where are you seeing the, the, the credit cycle at the moment? Well, yeah, look, there are some pockets that is concerning. So commercial real estate is is somewhere that you've got to be <laughs> That's really, the obvious one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But and then the implications from that. And so, you know, some of the small banks, and we saw it already in March this year, you know, the, the distress that comes out of balance sheets in the US regional banks. Um, what, what happens there? So you want to steer clear of, of kind of credit in that area. Okay. Well, on that note, last bids. If anyone's got anything to say, otherwise I'm going to have to close the show up. Thanks, Final, James. all silent. Okay. Thank you very much. I have been joined by Head of Asset Allocation at Mason Stevens, David Macri. I think I sp- – did I get that right? Uh, Macri. 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 Yeah. Okay. I'm doing the French pronunciation. Uh, and – <laughs> the, and from Morningstar, um, uh, it's, it's always good to have you here, uh, Jody Fitzgerald, Head of Institutional Investment Management. Thank you. No worries. Uh, this has been – what has it been? This has been the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. And look, if you have any more questions or anything, get onto the, uh, the Ensemble website, uh, ask any questions, and I'll make sure they get answered in future podcasts. I am James Whelan, uh, Managing Director of Barclay Pierce Capital Management. I think that's the name of it. Just make it up as we go along. Um, And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'll see you next time.